It's all yours, Chris. Good afternoon. Happy Saturday. Happy post-Halloween. Happy November. Um, happy anything. Anything you want it to be. <clears throat> My name is Christopher Mowdy, and I'm going to be moderating a debate today. The debate is going to be between Tony Reid and Nephilim Free. For those of you unfamiliar with these two characters, um, let me tell you a little something about Tony. Tony is a science communicator whose education, he admits, is mostly that of an autodidact, even though he did go to college. Um, for the past five years, he's hosted a show on YouTube called How Creationism Taught Me Real Science. In each episode of the show, he addresses individual creationist arguments by researching the primary resources behind the science they purportedly refute. He's also concluding the final season for the show, and we'll uh, begin addressing other pseudoscience, I guess, in other seasons. Um, and Nephilim, Nephilim Free, <clears throat> has been on YouTube for at least a decade. And he has been putting forth arguments for uh, young earth creationism. He's an apologist for such arguments. And um, he's, uh, he debates people frequently. He's very methodical. And uh, let's see if the two of them are going to come to some agreement or who is going to have the most rhetorical flair in presenting the merit of their arguments this afternoon. We talked a little bit before we uh, started recording to ensure that, uh, you know, we approach this with a level-headed, fair-minded fun. That's what this is. This is an exercise in uh, rhetoric and, uh, you know, getting some ideas across. So the format of today is going to be <clears throat> 10 minutes each, of an opening statement, 40 minutes where the two of them get to interactively discuss. Um, after that 40 minute period, they will each have five minutes for their closing statements. After that, there will be 20 minutes of a Q&A. Now the Q of the Q&A are going to come from you, they're gonna come from me. So <clears throat> as this debate is going on, I can see the um, chat. So if you have questions as we're going through things, please feel free to uh, post them. I'm going to be copy pasta them in copy pasta ing them into a document for me to um, uh, source during the Q and A section. So please do be an active uh, uh, member of the audience. With that being said. Uh, neither Tony nor Neff uh, have a preference as to who goes first. It was told that I should just flip a coin. Instead of flipping a coin, I'm just going to give the floor to the new guy. And by new guy, I mean the guy that's new to me. So, Tony, you have 10 minutes for your opening statement. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you, Nephilim Free. Thank you, Chris Fermati. Thank you, I Am That I Am. Um, today's debate topic is <laughs> – pardon me, I'm getting my notes up here – it's whether evolution or creationism have scientific application. So for the purpose of this debate, we'll work under the assumption that evolution is 100% wrong, creationism is 100% correct, and I'm not saying whether either assertion is true. In fact, I'm not even going to try to get anyone to stop believing in creationism. What I am going to do is demonstrate that even if creationism were 100% correct, it is still scientifically useless. And even if evolution is 100% wrong, it still has scientific applications that you take advantage of every day. Much to the chagrin of people on both sides of this debate, I'm going to be treating both views, yes, even creationism, as theories. Now, when we discuss scientific application of a theory, we're not claiming that, pardon me, we're not claiming that any theory is ever proven. We're just, we're also not discussing in the individual phenomena that are consistent with the theory. What we're talking about is, um, what we're talking about is a confirmation of scientific predictions that are made by the theory. And this is how new discovery, discoveries and real word applications are made. It starts by formulating a hypothesis. Now, very simply, it goes like this. If theory A is true, then we should expect to see phenomenon B when we conduct experiment or ex observation C. The next obvious step is to conduct experiment or observation C and then determine whether you see phenomenon B as theory A predicted. 
Now, based on whether you do see phenomenon B, your theory is either supported or it is rejected or revised. Now, based on Nephilim Free's past presentation, I'm going to make a prediction. I predict that he will not present any scientific application for creationism whatsoever. Not one thing that was ever discovered by, detesting, by testing any hypothesis derived from the assumption of a creation event. He may present evidence that is consistent with the assumption of a creation event, but he'll never show any creation scientists ever using the assumption of a creation event to make any discovery or any real world op application. What he'll probably do is present a discovery and then retroactively claim it was predicted by creationism all along. Neff may attempt to present holes in the theory of common descent, but he'll conveniently fail to mention how often this assumption has been used to predict the evidence. For example, after the lobe-finned fish Eustoneptoron was found in 385 million year strata in 1881, and then Ichthyostega was discovered in 365 million year strata in 1932, One, ah, there one you quick go. thing, there Tony. Is. Can you go share ahead. this full screen? Because uh, we're only seeing it on your uh, camera. If you can share that full screen, and everyone can see that. I don't know how to. What do I do? That what, what it, do I it do? looks like it's filling the chat, uh, the uh, screen to me in the uh, Zoom window that I have. Open. Yeah, but I it's still it. not full screen. It, it, what you have to do is go down to share. It's like a, a green briefcase and it says share there and if you can click that and then it gives okay, you hit share yes uh, there right. we go now oh. we're good my apologies for not knowing oh no yeah here. it's it's kind of hard complex to get through all that the, give give tony another uh 60 seconds yeah on, let's uh, get yeah. this restarted over well i appreciate that so um Eustoneptoron found in 385 million year strata in 1881 then Ichthyostega was discovered in 365 million year strata in 1932. Three scientists were able to predict ahead of time that they should expect to find the fossil of a creature which appeared to have uh, wrist bones similar to tetrapods and yet rays similar to ray fin fishes with spiracles in the head which would be indicative of a lung system in addition to a pectoral girdle separating the head from the body with a neck. They predicted that this morphological combination of tetrapod and fish-like traits would be found in Devonian strata between Ichthyostega and Eusinepteron in on Ellsmoor Island, Nunavut in northern Canada. After five years of ex excavation, they found no less than three individuals matching those exact traits. These individuals were named Tiktaalik, pretty well known. Now, these predictions keep coming. In fact, just last week, another species of early tetrapod called Parmastega was found strat stratigraphically between Tiktaalik and Eustoneptoron. Uh, whenever you see timelines of tetrapod to mammal evolution, whale evolution, horse evolution, or even human evolution, the assumption of common descent has told scientists exactly where to look stratigraphically as well as geographically for thousands of these individual fossil species showing transitional traits. Common descent has repeatedly made and continues to make these kinds of predictions, but Nephilim Free will never present an instance when an assumption of a worldwide flood or a six-day creation event was ever used to find any newly discovered fossil species. While Nephilim Free might attempt to present weaknesses in the concept of uniformitarianism, which requires an old earth, he will conveniently fail to mention the fact that uniformitarianism is used every day by geologists to predict where to find minerals like oil, coal, gas, etc. So if you drive a car, you're benefiting from the scientific application of assuming an old earth. Nephilim Free will be unable to cite any example of a geologist ever discovering any of these minerals by assuming a worldwide flood. Now, while Nephilim Free might attempt to, rep to present weaknesses in the Big Bang Theory, he'll conveniently fail to mention the fact that the cosmic microwave background radiation was predicted decades ahead of time by Big Bang Theory.
which was first formulated in 1922 by Alexander Freeman and then rediscovered in 1927 by Georges Lemaitre, who was incidentally a creationist and felt that the model indicated a creation event. Now, whether or not there were, ever was a creation event, the model states that at some point in the finite past, all of the matter and energy in the universe was condensed into a small volume. Pardon me here. Now, using this model in 1946, George Gamow published a paper and theorized that just after the Big Bang, microwaves would be released at a temperature of 50 Kelvin. This estimate was revised several times over the following years as quantum mechanics was developed, and I may end up discussing that later. But in 1964, Robert H. Dick, Jim Peebles, and David Wilkinson at Princeton University predicted that the cosmic background radiation would have been released along with matter at the Big Bang and due to billion years of billions of years of redshift would be te at a temperature of under 5 Kelvin. It just so happened that at the same time, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were working at nearby Bell Labs, experimenting on, experimenting on bouncing radio waves off of echo balloon satellites, and after canceling out any potential radio sources, they continued hearing a low, steady, mysterious noise that persisted in their receiver in every direction. They had discovered microwave background radiation at a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. This confirmed the hypothesis of Dick, Peebles, and Wilkinson and resulted in a Nobel Prize for physics. Now, the list of predictions goes on and on. I'll be happy to discuss more, but my point, like I said before, is that even if evolution were 100% wrong and creationism were 100% correct, creationism still has exactly zero practical applications, while evolutionism, if I may use the term, has endless scientific applications that we are privileged to use and be able to take advantage of every single day. So here's another prediction. What Nephilim Free will almost certainly present is that individual phenomena that he feels are inconsistent with the theory of evolution, abiogenesis, uniformitarianism, or the Big Bang cosmology. He may also attempt to refute certain claims which none of these theories make. If he's savvy, he may even present real evidence that is consistent with the creation model that no creationist ever predicted until after it was discovered. And I'll point this out every time because in the end, he's doing this instead of presenting scientific applications for creationism, which is the agreed upon subject for this debate. So this debate, so this debate is a scientific test of my theory that creationism has no scientific applications. So in this test, theory A is that creationism has no scientific applications. Phenomenon B is that NAF will attempt to present weaknesses in evolution instead of presenting any scientific applications for creationism. Observation or experiment C is this debate. So to state my hypothesis, if creationism has no scientific applications, then Nephilim Free will attempt to present weaknesses in evolution instead of presenting any scientific applications of creationism over the course of this debate. And that's what I have to say. So let's see what you have to say, Nat. Okay, so that was Tony's 10-minute introduction with 30 seconds left. Well done, well done. Um, much appreciated. And so... Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to try to kind of paraphrase what you uh, what you just said to, to kind of make sure that I have my head wrapped around it. And in doing so, hopefully the audience will have their head wrapped around it as well. And I'll do it while my wife is texting me sizes for shoes that she's looking at for me <laughs> while she's out shopping. Um, so, uh, Tony, you did a very clever rhetorical trick where in, uh, uh, in presenting the case, that um, evolution is applicable to science because it confirms scientific predictions, you're using this debate itself as kind of a scientific experiment where you've put forth predictions that you expect to come true through the observations of the debate itself. Is that fair? I think so, yeah. 
Okay. Well, I'm trying to paint it neutral. I, I hope uh, I hope I'm not coloring it incorrectly. And the point that you're making is that evolution has endless scientific applications, whereas creationism has no scientific applications. That's the bumper sticker. Yes. Okay. All right. So now we get to hear from Neff. Ten minutes. Let me get my timer started. And Neff, whenever you're ready, you can begin. Okay. So first thing I'll say is that if creation is true, then intelligent de the intelligent design of things, especially biological systems, is expected. That would be a symptom. When somebody creates something, it's always designed. They put design properties into it. So if the world was created, if life was created, then we would expect intelligent design to be true by default, by, uh, by, de by default. So first about this matter, uh, Dr. Mark Kirshner, founding chair of Department Systems Biology at Harvard University, has said this. In fact, over the last 100 years, almost all of biology has proceeded in independent of evolution, except evolutionary biology itself. Microbi molecular biology, biochemistry, and physiology have not taken evolution into account at all. In other words, you don't have to know anything about what you believe about the origin of things to do science with it. All you need to know is the properties of it. For example, physicians don't need to have a clue about evolution theory to do medicine, and they don't use it when they treat disease because it just doesn't matter. It doesn't figure in. Um, uh, Professor uh, Philip Skell, uh, an evolutionist, American chemist, emeritus uh, Evan Hugh professor at Pennsylvania St State University, one of the most prominent university research universities in the world, says, uh, none of the discoveries of biology and medicine in the past century are dependent on guidance from Darwinian evolution. It provided no support. So I'm, my statement is that evolution is not scientifically true and can never be applied in science in any way. People, evolutionists believe they're applying evolution to science, but they are not. So the kinds of changes the evolutionists propose, antibiotic immunity, somatic mutation, genetic recombination mutation, uh, changes to allele fre frequency, physiological adaptation, these are not evolutionary changes. These are horizontal change, not vertical change. It doesn't support evolution. You can't apply evolution to science when you're talking about these things. And these are the things that evolutionists talk about claiming you can apply them in science. See, for example, finches are still finches. The morphological difference between them is not anatomical. There's no evolution there. Neither is there any evolution in getting various breeds of dog from wolves. That's horizontal change, not vertical change. No evolution. You can't apply that to science. So evolutionists claim that they're applying evolution to science when they see dogs vary or when they see various things that they're in their imagination, but it's not applying science, evolution to science. It's applying, applying their ideas about evolution to science. Vertical change is what you see on the right. That can't be applied to science. Horizontal change can be. The evolutionist's idea of vertical change cannot be and has never been applied to science. For example, these are the things that evolutionists claim that they're applying to science. The discovery of evolutionary paths from one taxa to another by studying genetic similarities, phylogenetics, for example. Well, firstly, genes are created. They can't have arisen by evolutionary processes. Therefore, you're not applying anything evolutionary to science. Gene prediction. Increased likelihood of finding a gene in a specific location in the genome of one species because a similar gene with a similar function is found in the genome of another species. But similar similarities in genetics is not evidence of evolution. I'm going to give more information about that. So you're not applying anything in evolution to science when you do this. Immunology, designing drugs to, to defeat the immune system of viruses and bacteria. Evolutionists claim the, the ability of a bacteria to gain an immunity to an antibiotic is evolutionary change, and therefore we keep, we're doing science when we design antibiotics. That's not true. That's not evolutionary change. It doesn't change the structural design of a bacteria or a virus one iota for it to gain an immunity. Nothing. No number of such changes can ever morph a bacteria into something fundamentally different. It's not evolutionary change. That's horizontal change. You're not applying evolution to science when you talk about immunology. It's not evolution. Algorithms. Using the algorithms found in the DNA molecule to design better human computer algorithms for search and, and, and comparison of information. This is actually being done. This is applying intelligent design because algorithms arise from intelligence only. Evolution cannot have imparted evolu uh, uh, um, algorithms to the information in the DNA. It's impossible. Algorithms arise from intelligence only. 
It's not even possible for an algorithm to arise by chemistry. Therefore, when we find algorithms in DNA and try to apply them to computer science, what we're applying is creation to, to, to a science, not, not evolution. The fact that the universe and biological systems were created makes science possible because the ordering, complexity, interdependency, and purpose of the things that exist uh, make us possible for us to study and utilize them. An example, uh, treatment of a disease depends upon a properly functioning system that has experienced entropic change. Beliefs about the origin of the system play no part in treatment of disease. However, the properties of biological systems verify that they were created. So we're applying creation to science and medicine, not evolution. So here are some examples of how evolution, uh, creation uh, in, through intelligent design has been applied in science. Uh, the design feature are bump-like tubercles on the, on the humpback whales, which reduce stall and improve aquadynamics. The application is that scientists are now using this to create things like improved fans, you see that the bumps on the fan, it improves aerodynamics. It's a superior design. Where'd they get that idea? From whales. Here's another. The design feature of the, 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 the feet of a gecko, it, it enables the creature to walk straight up and down glass, a perfectly smooth surface. This is being applied to all kinds of dry glues. Where'd they get the idea? From geckos. Geckos were designed. Here's another. Mercedes-Benz took this took the shape of the, of the particular box fish and used it to design the front end of an automobile for improved aerodynamics. Where'd you get the idea? From creation. Evolution couldn't do that. Velcro is another beautiful example. Velcro is a feature of, uh, of cockle burrs that allows the seeds to attach to things so they can be transported and promote the species in other environments. And the result was the invention of Velcro. So here's another. Uh, the, uh, I hope I say this right. The high-speed uh, Shinkansen bullet train in Japan. The designers took inspiration from the beak of a type of bird called kingfishers to design the front end of it, and the result is more stability and better aerodynamics. They used creation to do it. Here's another. Uh, the, the skin of sharks uh, was used as inspiration for NASA to create what's called riblets film, which improves aer aqua dynamics. It was even used on a ship. The, uh, a boat that won a race, because, partly because of its increased aquadynamics. The sharks, the wings. Uh, Otto Lilienthal uh, uh, is the man who was first successful for numerous uh, unpowered flights. He got his inspiration from the wings of birds. That's implying intelligent design, not evolution. Um, here's another. Uh, the design feature of the what's called the lotus effect, the petals of a lotus plant, they cannot be wetted. The water will beat on them all the time. And this is being applied in science to all kinds of materials that create waterproofing, as you can see in the picture below. Here's another. The design of the, of the termites used to create their mounds automatically creates airflow, which creates improved cooling and condensation. This is now being applied in, uh, in, in architecture, such as an Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe. The building has automatic cooling and condensation it, it creates its own water supply to some degree because of the design of the mounds created by termites using that. Um, here's another bird protection glass. This is glass that birds can see so they don't fly into it and kill, break their necks. Designed uh, based on uh, a, a, a design feature in life. Here's a recent one. An efficient new depth sensor was inspired by eye, spider eyes. That's, this is a recent article. Biometrics Laboratory at MIT. They're using all kinds of features at, that are designed into living systems to create technologies that improve our lives. And these are just a few of them. Engineers, proteins stick like glue, and they've figured out how to make better adhesives by looking at proteins. Another, here comes the sun. A new sunflower-inspired pattern creates solar energy. And here's another. This website here provides numerous examples. Okay. Now, predictions. Can predictions be made? Absolutely. In 1984, um, creation scientist Dr. Russell Humphreys, former uh, director of Sandia National Laboratories, predicted the magnetic fields of the various planets in our solar system based on the idea that they were created only 6,000 years ago. When NASA sent out their, their, uh, their, their space probes and measured the Voyager 2 spacecraft, for example, 
it measured their magnetic fields, and guess what? Dr. Humphrey's prediction of their magnetic fields was spot on, based on a 6,000-year-old creation from the solar system. He predicted every single one of them and was right about every single one of them based on the idea, the understanding that they're only 6,000 years old, not millions. How's that for prediction? In, in between 1997 and 2006, a team of scientists, creationist scientists at two different creationist organizations created a project called Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth. And they, get, they, they estimated, they predicted that if the Earth was only thousands of years old, we should find, because helium is a very slippery molecule, super small, and escapes from, from granite and crystals very rapidly, we should find that the rate and the amount of, of helium in the in the crystals of zircon crystals of granites throughout the earth should show a six thousand year old age for those granites they were exactly all right enough the time has come do you want to wrap it up do you want a couple more seconds uh, well, just to I wrap it just, up yeah i'll just say i have other predictions that show that science uh that predicting a young earth creation model has has shown that uh science can be applied by pr prediction can be made based on young earth creation uh, model and uh and, and hold true Okay, so that was Neff with his introductory 10 minutes where he was arguing for, <clears throat> excuse me, creationism science, creationist science to be um, applicable in science, right? Creationism to be a model that could be applied in science. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in the same way that I attempted to kind of paraphrase and summarize uh, Tony's point, I'm going to try to do the same with you, Neff. Um, uh, your argument against evolution being applied to science is that you your argument is that they're not you're they're not applying evolution to science they're applying ideas of evolution to science that's that's correct and and also uh design features uh, a lot of your presentation was showing how design features of living systems are being used for technological and engineering innovation and then you started talking about how a creationist model can make uh accurate predictions, risky predictions, and for example, Dr. Humphrey's magnetic field prediction. Fair? Sounds right. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we open it up. So you gentlemen are going to be interacting with each other, um, responding to each other's opening statements, asking each other questions, answering each other's questions. I do very much expect this to be a level-headed, charitable, and respectful conversation. I'll be chiming in when I have to, but otherwise, I'm going to set my timer for 40 minutes, and I'm going to let the two of you have an awesome discussion. Tony, let me ask you a question. Um, if, if, if any of the things that I've said, and I had others that I didn't provide, uh, are true, that, for example, that uh, uh, based upon a 6,000-year-old creation that Dr. Russell Humphreys pr accurately predicted the magnetic fields of the planets in our solar system, if that's true, wouldn't that invalidate your statement that creation can't be used, uh, can't make accurate predictions in science? Well, it would seem that way, except that you need to read his actual paper. And what he did is calculate based on the masses of the planets. Now, the thing is, we thought Jupiter was much heavier than it really is. And in the end, he was wrong about Jupiter. He, he, he was correct about the masses of the, other, of the other planets, so he was correct about the magnetic field. Um, and I will be, it's funny that you should mention that. And that, that'd be your first question because that's actually my next episode on my show. So um, you, you, you think that he got Jupiter wrong, but uh, th that's not what I've, what I've read. Um, I don't, uh, he didn't get any of them wrong from what I've read. But even, no, if, but he, he, miss it. If, even if he were off somewhat on Jupiter and, and nailed the others, uh, doesn't that still invalidate your, your claim that if, if he could accurately predict what the magnetic fields of those planets would be based on their age, then your statement that the creation model can't be applied in science, that would be incorrect, wouldn't it not? Okay, again, you need to read his paper because he calculated using his own creative math that the, I mean, that the, ma the magnetic field of the Earth should have had an exponential decay from a creation event 10,000 years ago. And then for the rest of the planet, planets, sorry, there's an echo in my head, or in, my, in my headphones here. But um, based on the, the uh, mass of the rest of the planets, that's how he calculated their magnetic fields. How so he did no. it. 
how he did it. I, I really don't see that as a as, as an end all. He did it, and, and it was based on six thousand year old creation, and he was his, they were accurate. And and in fact, you you are aware, aren't you, that the magnetic fields uh, of that have been discovered of those planets have caused secular scientists to scratch their heads because they predicted that they would have diff very greatly different magnetic fields. They were shocked to find out what they actually were. Well, Russell Humphreys was surprised to find out, uh, um, what, that he, what, um, was not surprised rather, but he was uh, happy to find out that his prediction was correct. So they don't fit the secular model. They, NASA was scratching their heads about the magnetic fields being what they are because their prediction failed. But Dr. Humphrey's predictions were accurate. That's what I would point out about that. that in the end, it doesn't matter. His were predictions were accurate. Fooled. I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't. I thought you were finished. Uh, which secular scientists were fooled? Because I have NASA. seen no evidence of that, and I've not seen any evidence of his projections being any more accurate than NASA's. Okay. In fact, well, with I, Jupiter, he was actually way off. Okay, so I, I can provide that for you. I don't have that in front of me. I have that information, but uh, uh, so yeah, I'm just going to. Uh, reiterate NASA's predictions about the magnetic fields of the planets has never been right. And uh, it, I'll try to find that information and show that to you or share it with you. Uh, they've even, some of them have made uh, statements to that effect. So uh, yeah, no, their, their predictions were, were, were all off. And I hate to be self-promotional here, but next Friday, everybody, you can watch my episode on planetary magnetism. And you will find that I'll present both NASA's predictions, Russell's predictions, his own paper, and you can read it for yourself. Yes. You don't even have to wait for Nephilim free. That sounds is there, is there Are there any other arguments of yours that you'd like me to address? Oh, well, I've, sure, plenty. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, physicist John Baumgartner uh, developed a creation theory for the rapid motion of the Earth's crust during the flood model, uh, during the flood. And he predicted that cold slabs of crust would be found inside the Earth because they got there rapidly. You understand that if a massive slab of material were subducting at a rate your fingernails grow, which is what uh, the, the rate that they're moving now, roughly, uh, once before that material reached uh, thousands of kilometers down inside the Earth, it would have been heated by the materials around it because it gets deep, hot deep in the earth. To, secular scientists were surprised to find that the material is coal. Now, that fits the creation model of the material being shoved, subducted rapidly into the earth during the flood, but doesn't jive with the secular idea that the continents and plates were subducted at the rate your fingernails grow over millions and millions of years. John Baumgartner's model was accurate. In fact, his software that he developed for predicting a continental plate movement uh, and the materials we find in the Earth is still to this day the most accurate uh, uh, computer model that has ever been written for that product. How, how do you explain Baumgartner's ability to predict cold slabs of continental crust deep inside the Earth using the flood model if it's not applying science? Well, first of all, you're misrepresenting what the actual the findings were, they're definitely cold compared to the, uh, the subcrustal environment they're in, yes. but no, he didn't predict that they were cold. They're just cold. They're just not as hot, yes, he which did. would be expected <laughs> if they had subducted from above. However, if you want to talk about, uh, predictions in that you're, cause you're, uh, you very, uh, you're very vocal about, uh, being against subduction in 1962, no, American geologist, Robert Coates published his observations of subduction in the Aleutian arc in the journal G of physics. It was among the first countless papers that detailed the detection of earthquakes deep within the crust upon the paths of subduction zones. And that culminated in 2013, with Marco Pills, Stefano Paroli, and Dino Bindi publishing results of their experiments using a passive seismic sonar and a technique that kind of resembles an ultrasound, but on a grand scale. And this result was a three-dimensional image of the Isik Atta Fault in Kyrgyzstan and a visual confirmation of the process of subduction being observed. The, these theories of plate tonic, tectonics and continental drift are continually vindicated. I can go on on that forever. I've done an entire episode on that. What, what I meant to, when I earlier asked you was, are, are there any other 
arguments you made in your opening statements that you'd like me to address. Yes, uh, it, well, you, you, you misrepresented my statement. I, I've never been a, a, against a subduction. I'm not against subduction. And, uh, and when you, you, you misrepresented the statement, when, when, when I said that he predicted them to be cold, this means in relation to the materials around them. It doesn't mean they're ice cold in any way. That was kind of a straw man, uh, 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 a, a kind of a straw man. Uh, okay, so he, so are, he, he did predict them to, be, to be have a, 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 dra a dramatically different temperature, and the, an unexpected difference in temperature, and that's exactly what was found. That's why it's lately, it's, we call it, uh, colloquially call it cold. Okay. Who said that was unpredicted? Uh, well, the, the time unpredicts it, doesn't predict it. Millions no. of years of material go, uh, going down into the earth at the rate your fingernails grow is not plausible to believe that the material is going to remain at a significant difference in temperature. I mean, can you show me a scientific reason to believe that you take something of considerably different temperature and push it at the rate your fingernails grow into something that's 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 degrees warmer and that it's not going to warm up? See, it, it doesn't add up. That's the thing, Tony. Doesn't that happen? Nobody's saying it wouldn't warm up. We're saying it would be lower in temperature. And that was predicted. You said he predicted it in 1981. This was predicted in 1962. So congratulations. You just predicted something that already been predicted. But again, I'm going to go back to the question I just asked no, you. I, I, are, there I any other, are there any other arguments you made in your opening statement that, I ha that you'd like me to address specifically? Well, I... Um, I, I, I doubt seriously that that was predicted in 1962. I, I think you're misrepresenting the scientific, uh, the science information. But okay, I've got the paper on it. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and put it in the comments if they'll let me. Okay, but but the design features of living things have been used. Uh, you say science can't be applied, uh, creation can't be applied, but the design features of living systems are being applied to create and improve technology constantly. Uh, so your your idea that creation can't be used to uh, applied in science is is false. In fact, um, the very uh, fact that bacteria uh, gain immunity is, is predicted by intelligent design. Uh, it's it, those things are intelligently designed. The somatic mutation mechanism in the immune system of living things is algorithmic. It operates with algorithms. Algorithms come only from intelligence. You cannot apply bacterial immunity. It cannot be said to be evolution being applied to the field of medicine. It's impossible because algorithms cannot be produced by an evolutionary process. They come only from intelligence. So uh, the algorithmic somatic mutation system of the immune systems of every living thing in this world cannot be a product of evolution but must be must be a product of intelligent design. And therefore, we're applying a symptom of creation, which is that the creation was intelligently designed in science. It's certainly not anything evolution could do. So it's not evolution applied to science. Can you understand that? OK, first of all, uh, when we planned this debate, you promised me I wouldn't bring up anything about microevolution. And what you're talking about is microevolution, no, I didn't which say you agree that. to. No, no, I didn't. It's not? Is it no, not the I result of a genetic? I, I, I didn't say any such thing. And nonetheless, even. All right, hold on. I, we're I not let debating you talk for five minutes. You've we're let not me debating microevolution. You're already interrupting me. I showed you the respect of listening to every word you had to say. But you you're misrepresenting. You sure as hell show me the same respect. Well, respect me by not misrepresenting what I say. You did. In, are you saying that's not a result of of a, a change in allele frequency? I'm not debating microevolution. I'm that's pointing right. out that's that, what you're doing. No, I'm pointing out that that these changes are not evolution, a product of evolution. Therefore, we're not applying evolutionists claim that a bacterial immunities is an example of evolution being applied in science. Is that not true? Of course, it's true, and so I'm pointing Mi out microevolution, which you're not refuting, correct? I am pointing out that 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 is that statement of evolutionists is not true. That bacterial immunities, gaining immunities, is an example of evolution being applied in science is not true because bacterial immunities are not evolution. That's what I'm pointing out. Well, you did admit that they were microevolution, and I'm not disagreeing with it. 
you're not disagreeing with it. So it's irrelevant to this conversation. No, no. Now, no, no. this said, I'm going to go ahead and re address the rest of what you said, because you were talking about all these designs that we see in nature and you're calling it designed features in nature, but they were not predicted by by creation. They were observed first, then you retroactively apply them to creationism after they've been used to develop something else. They were not, there was nobody who said, if creationism in tru is true, we should see Velcro, or uh, we should see cockles and be able to develop Velcro. We should see whale bumps. And I didn't and give those as an example of that. Tony, you're Did misrepresenting. You no, I, I, I the, re the, no, the recording here. No, I, I showed those as examples of intelligent design that are being applied in science. I didn't say they were predicted. You mistake. Well, then you confused. are not. Then you're not. Uh, you're not even addressing I, the subject. This, I've already the, applied. The, the subject is how do you apply creationism to science? I've science already addressed Science is about that. getting. Hey, I'm, I'm, listen. I'm going to let you talk. You you got like five minutes to talk. Okay, here's the deal. You did not present any prediction made by creation ahead of time. What you've noticed is what you pointed out was people seeing something that already existed and then making a, making a discovery on it, and then you're applying it to creationism. That's completely the opposite of science. No, that's, that's not at all. You're misrepresenting what I said. I provided examples where intelligent design properties have been applied in science. I'm also provided two examples where the prediction that of creation has been applied in science. Here's another one. In 2000, yes. Dr. David DeWitt, along with several other creationist scientists, predicted that the changes that occurred in, in the gen genome of Neanderthals would be very much like this, the, the locations and the types of changes that have occurred in, in modern humans based on the fact that Neanderthal was fully and modern human, which is what creationists have always been saying, that they were a disease-ridden tribe of mankind produced after the flood of Noah, after the Tower of Babel affair. And that's what creationists have always been saying. Scientific study determined, found out that that is exactly correct, that the, the types and locations of genetic change that have occurred in the DNA of, of, of uh, Neanderthal is very much like those that occur in modern humans. Therefore, this is evidence you see that Neanderthal was nothing but human. But you know, that's not the story we've been getting from the evolutionists. That they All were right, now if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you just for a moment, I'm going to pause the time. And Tony, before you address that, I think that it's worth noting that <clears throat> from the outside looking in, pause, from the outside looking in, it looks like there's a little bit of confusion, and I think it's worth disentangling a, a, a couple of things. In Neff, in your 10-minute introduction, you spent some time um, uh, uh, showing how design features of living systems are used within technology and engineering innovations. And for you, that is creation being applied in science, because science in can encompass uh, uh, technology and engineering. Is, is that a fair assessment? I guess. Okay. The only reason why I bring it up is because I think that... Um, you using it for that purpose, I think that it's it's worth phrasing like that to Tony because for Tony, for it to be applied to science means something different, right? So uh, I, I I think when it comes to the Q and A part, I'm going to ask you guys to to define what you mean by science. But if you want to address that now, I think that it'll help disentangle what Neff's efforts are to show how. Cre uh, created design features of living systems are being used in science, science being technology, science being engineering, and stuff like that. In addition to, he has a separate argument that there are predictions made from creationist stances that are used for scientific purposes, right? I think those are two different branches that okay. Neff is bringing up. Okay. So, I, I, so moving forward, if they can be addressed as separately, uh, the, the separate things that they are, I think it'll help with a, a more productive conversation. Sure. I, I'm going to start could, the time. Okay. So, Tony, I'm gonna, uh, you, you said that uh, my, my statement about the magnetic fields is not right, but I pasted into the text chat of this uh, hangout, of uh, this discussion, a paper called Evidence for Crustal Magnetic Signature on, on Mercury from Messenger, Magnet, uh, Magnetometer Observations, published in, uh, and this was uh, what they discovered was that Mercury had a magnetic field 
that was much more strong than they predicted. They predicted it had it would have an extremely weak one, but it had a far stronger magnetic field. So I, I, this is an example of what you said is not true, that they acted that NASA was not surprised, not left scratching their heads based on the magnetic, the discovery of the magnetic field, which Humphreys accurately depicted. Another example is a paper titled Mercury's decay rate is so rapid from some future space probe could detect it fairly soon in 19, the 1990 uh, plan, uh, planet magnetic field should have been 1.8% smaller than its 1975 value. That was an, a, not a science paper, but that's, that's a discovery. So the magnetic fields of these planets is, it, 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 for example, Venus's magnetic field was discovered to be very different from what they believed it would be. Uh, the same thing is true for uh, several of the of, of the body of the moons in our solar system, not just the planets. I can provide several scientific sources, secular scientific sources, that where they predict the magnetic field of a planet should be X, and they come find out it's dramatically different based on what Voyager found out. So. I, I think you're uninformed about this matter. The papers that I, uh, the, the fact that NASA was left scratching their heads because their predictions were considerably off uh, is true. Maybe not, you're not aware of it. Um, are you looking at a different chat than I am? Because I don't see him anywhere. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm giving some water to my wife. She's thirsty. Um, so I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I pasted a, a one source in, in the, in the uh, and here, here's an example. And here's another. I'll read it to you. The overall intensity of the field is declining at a rate of 26 nano uh, Teslans. Uh, per year. If this rate of decline were to continue, the magnetic field would reach zero in 1,200 years. This is from Magnetic Field Decline Science, June 28th, 1980. So it's been a long time they've been predicting these magnetic fields to discover, whoa, we're way heck off, way off. So Scientific American published this. In the next two millennia, if the present rate of decay is sustained, the dipole component of the Earth's magnetic field should be zero. That was published Scientific American, December 1989. But guess okay, what? Well, it, it, it's not. See, so their predictions of the magnetic field based on their uh, uh, their uh, model for the solar system formation uh, is has not worked out. It's been off. Uh, well, first of all, you haven't posted those links, so I can't really comment on exactly what they say. What I can say is from what I've read on it all is, I mean, I've even done a, an episode on just Earth's magnetic field, and we know that there are, you know, artifacts we found in villages in Mesopotamia from just 6,000 uh, 6, years ago where the magnetic field is significantly lower than it is now. So what we know for sure is that the magnetic field has changed several times. Now, Russell, Russell Humphreys has, has admitted that the magnetic field has reversed polarity many times, which I'm going to congratulate you for uh, agreeing with him on that because uh, there's another uh, person I've debated, Kent Hovind, who uh, claims that that's just a certain measure of weakness. He didn't uh, – it's, it's almost like he didn't never heard of magnetites. But the magnetic moment is 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 uh, recorded in every single uh, uh, material artifact that that is that is uh, solidified, and we have seen over the years that the or at least as as we go back in history that the magnetic field has changed going up and and down several times throughout history. Yeah. It's going so I don't down. see where you're going. That with doesn't it. contradict anything that creationists believe. However, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, yeah, it does. No, I, it since not you're, at all. since Russell Humphrey's entire model is based on uh, what's the incremental decline or uh, sorry, um, exponential decline. That's not what we. That's not what we observe. Russell Humphrey's predicted that we would find those fluctuations in the magnetic field. Did you know that? Here, here's another yeah, he one. Yeah, he definitely yeah, predicted right. it after it was already discovered, certainly. Okay, he, he predicted it. So here, here's another example. Uh, uh, 
Evolutionists have been claiming that the majority of the DNA molecule is junk, left garble, left over, uh, that's been abandoned by evolution over the last hundreds of thousands of years, and in our genome is largely junk, and that they they actually believe that uh, the only thing in the human genome that wasn't junk was almost exclusively protein codes the information that, that, that codes for a protein production. So they, they relegated the rest of the genome to junk. As far back as the 1970s and 80s, creationist scientists were making the prediction that the vast majority of the DNA molecule would be discovered to be useful and functional information, and that none of it, if any of it, was garble left over by evolution, that we would find it had function. Today, we know 87% that as current knowledge, we might find more percent of the DNA molecule is transcribed by the, by polymerase into RNA, the workhorses of the cell. So, so this prediction of evolution failed, and the creationist was right. Now, please don't tell. Please, if the creation, if what you say about creation can't predict things based on a creation model, can you explain to me why the creations creationists predicting that the vast majority of DNA would be found to be functional in some way? And uh, and is, and they even predicted that it would be information used during fetal development to create the organism. That's holding true as well. Therefore, it, based on this one example alone, isn't your claim that, that creation predictions based on creation that can't be applied in science is invalidated? Okay. Well, first of all, let's start with your misrepresentation of creationists, which said that all of the DNA would have function. Now, here's the thing. We, we don't know that for sure. But second is, in the scientific literature, here's another misrepresentation you've made. Junk DNA has never meant functionless. David Cummings coined the term junk DNA in 1972. And what he said was, this is a quote, these considerations suggest that up to 20% of the genome is actively used and the remaining 80 plus percent is junk. But being junk doesn't mean it is entirely useless. Common sense suggests that anything that is completely useless would be discarded. There are several possible functions for d junk DNA end quote. And in fact, several functions were proposed, not just in that paper, but they were observed starting even earlier, such as buffering against mutations. This was before he published that. Fluctuations in intracellular solute concentrations serving as binding sites for regulatory molecules, facilitating recombination, inhibiting recombination, influencing gene expression, maintaining chromosome structure and behavior, coordinating genome function, and providing multiple copies of genes to be recruited when needing. So he never, it never once meant it was useless. It's more like a junkyard. You ever go to a junkyard? There's not, not most of that stuff is actually useful. You have a Buick that's missing a fender. You can go to a junkyard and get a fender. Do you have a junk drawer in your kitchen? I'll bet you there's rubber bands and paper clips in there. None of them are functionless. They just aren't used very often, and therefore, they're not subjected to uh, natural selection, or at least they're, they're, they're less insulated from natural selection. That's kind of what they were talking about with junk DNA. Now, what they did find was not that it all had function. What they found was that it was transposed into messenger RNA that in turn ended up doing nothing in almost every single case. So you're misrepresenting the findings, you're misrepresenting the position of evolution, and you're misrepresenting creationists in general. Okay, Tony, everything you just said is false. First off, uh, the term junk DNA was coined by Japanese geneticist uh, Susomo Ono, not the fellow you said. Um, and, well, and, and you've also, you're, what, you, what I see you're doing is you're in denial of the fact that evolutionists have been claiming that it's junk. And it, no. what they mean by junk is junk. And they have not said that they believed uh, that the majority of it or any even large percentage of it would be discovered to be functional in, in the in human beings. That is not right. Your, your, your statement, that statement is a complete misrepresentation of the historical facts. And, I said, and I said it, the and author also, and the year. And, what do you and got? Also, uh, well, the author is, uh, the, the man is Susomo Ono, and it was 1972. That's when the term junk DNA was coined by him. And so, but you're also, you've misrepresented something else here. Um, 
when uh, creationists have not, uh, you said that it's been discovered that these RNA transcripts from the DNA, from what has been labeled for 45 years by evolutionists holding back genetic science for 40 years, by the way, um, has been discovered to be useless in every case. That is, is I don't know where you got that out of your hat. But I never that's, said it was that's, useless. That's false. That is not case. true. We don't, Tony, because we don't know the function of, of many of those RNAs doesn't mean that they're functionless. Nobody this is a, they were. I, 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 well, you just alluded that that the, the RNA transcripts from, from the, the junk DNA is functionless. In every case, you said, I, I quote you, in every case, end quote. No, I did not. That is the words that came out of your mouth. I three said that in ago. nearly every case, they found in, no function for it. Nearly every case. Okay, so, uh, no, no. You said is functionless. You did not say they Didn't found say it was no functionless. Function. No, sir. We're going to play that back later. Please we're do. See you. You're wrong. That's not what you said. And so that statement is is wrong. I, I know you maybe you're excited and you want to support evolution, but you misspoke. If that if nothing else. So what? Because we don't know the function of it. I've had lots of evolutionists tell me that that we don't know the function of those RNAs. Therefore, they're junk. They don't do anything. I debated Dr. Dan Larhammer, geneticist at the University of Uppsala, Sweden. He made the same ridiculous claim. Oh, they're junk. He said the RNAs they're useless. They don't have any function. It's not true. We just don't know what the function is because there's a lot that has not been discovered about the cells yet. So. Again, the, the, the junk DNA paradigm of evolutionists, you're in denial of it now. You're trying to say we never really thought it was junk. But lots of scientists have been saying it's junk and it's functionless. And, and it, some scientists have even said you could probably snip it out and the cell would go on functioning just fine. And, and uh, so you've misrepresented the facts. Well, here's the difference is that I'm willing to bet you can't find any case where a scientist published for peer review his assertion that none of that DNA had any purpose or function. I guarantee you can't do it. Why? Because it hasn't happened. And so I don't care about what an individual scientist said off the cuff to you in the middle of a debate trying to rescue his own position against your, your gish gallop from one thing to this. What I care about is what is presented as science and if you want to tell me that the textbooks are wrong, I'll go ahead and agree with you. I think textbooks are written poorly. I think they're doing their best to present, present science well, but it's difficult, especially when I hear misrepresentations like this. I have actually presented the quote from Cummings in 1972. Now, maybe Susumu Ono was attempting to compete with him with the term junk DNA, but they, but the first to publish it was Cummings in 1972. And I challenge you to prove me he, he, the he otherwise. Published it. He didn't coin the term. Oh no, uh, 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 coin the term. But, but, so he but, didn't, he but, but didn't Tony, publish Tony, it to, and, and stake his reputation on it, right? Uh, you know, if I say something first, that doesn't mean I have to publish it. Okay. So, but Tony, you've misrepresented the facts here. The evolutionists have been claiming for 45 years that, that the majority of DNA, because it doesn't code for, for, for D, uh, proteins, is in fact junk, and they thought it functionless. So you're, what you're doing is an evolutionist attempt to save face, in fact, uh, in, in the light of these facts. Evolutionists like to cover up the fact that they've made these scientific blunders for 40 years, and by saying, well, we never really thought it was junk, it's just leftovers. And so somehow it's still being used, even though it's junk. That's not what was the scientists have believed. That's not what secular scientists have been believing for 40 years. So, gentlemen, what? you have about 10 more minutes left in this section. And I, and I have to be honest. I think that the junk DNA argument has been played out between the two of you. I've paused the time. Yeah, only, and the only reason why I say that is because... <clears throat> Neff, uh, it seems like you're arguing against the idea that evolutionists have this perspective. Tony doesn't think evolutionists have that perspective. So going down that rabbit hole doesn't really tether to the topic of this particular debate. So I would very much like to get back on track with that. And if you know references are going to be used, um, <clears throat> if at all possible, references that the both of you are familiar enough to talk about because uh, when bringing up references that the other person doesn't have access to or f is familiar with, it, it, it uh, lends itself to cross-talking. Let's try to reduce the amount of cross-talking and just like get to the genuine points that the two of you want to bring up. So I'm going to start the clock again. Please proceed. Yep. 
Okay, so I'll just go ahead and address two of you, two more of your arguments. Number one, nurses and doctors that uh, work in the medical profession and see pa- see patients, they are applying science, but they aren't the ones that are making the discoveries. They're just benefiting from the discoveries that other scientists make. No disrespect to what they do. They know a lot, and that's great. And, and possibly they even know more than the people that actually make the discoveries in, in many cases. But the, all they are doing is applying the work that other people have done. No disrespect to you as, as, as well, Mr. Well, Christopher. Um, at the same time, the other one I was going to talk about, ID, you were talking about Michael Behe. Michael Behe accepts ID, but he has no problem with evolution. He just thinks that it, in certain places it required a, an intelligent designer to be along the way. But he has no problem with evolution. I understand that. But you've fallen into a, an evolutionist hole there, Tony. Um, because uh, there are people who uh, believe in uh, evolution or creation uh, it, it's not an argument against whether or not creation or evolution is being applied in science. It, this really makes no, no difference. Uh, who believes what? What the data, the, what the facts are, that's that's what matters. That's the only thing that matters. Now, uh, you believe, I, I, I assume, like so many evolutionists, that uh, the changes that occur in bacteria that enable them to become immune to an uh, antibiotic is, is evolution in progress, do you not? As every evolutionist I've ever heard speak on the subject or engaged with has acknowledged, do you not agree with, with everybody else? Let me uh, restate what you just said, because I want to make sure that I'm not misrepresented by that answer, because it is, if, if I was thinking of it from what I think is your point of view, it's a leading question. The answer to your question is, do I believe, or I do in fact believe that antibiotic resistance is a product of changes in allele frequencies in bacteria over time? Certainly. But I have, deci- I have agreed with you ahead of time to separate just a simple change in allele frequency from macroevolution, which is once the, which is that same process after speciation has occurred. I'm not saying that they've speciated yet. Yeah, that's to me irrelevant. You believe this is an evolutionary so. process, don't you? Because every evolutionist I've ever heard speak about it, and every evolutionist I've ever engaged with cites bacterial immunities as an, an example of evolution ongoing. Microevolution, macroevolution, irrelevant to me. It's they call it evolution. It's evolutionary process. Isn't that true? And well, uh, first of all, well, you just asked me a question. Let me answer. Um, I don't care what other evolutionists have said to you. I don't care what uh, somebody who debates you on a YouTube channel has ever said. What I'm saying is what I say and what what my position is. So don't ascribe to me other people's positions. Okay. I'm more than, if you, if you want me to gang up on them with you to tell them that they're wrong, feel free. I will. Okay. Oh, so you disagree with them that this is evolution in, in, in action? If by evolution you mean a change in allele frequency, no. If you say, if you mean ev- as, uh, if you mean evolution as in something beyond the species level, again, um, I would agree with you that it is not a change beyond the, the allele frequency. But you have a different definition of evolution, and I'm not going to speak to your definition of evolution. No, I'm going I- to speak to the scientific definition of evolution. Yeah, I don't have a definition for evolution. I just accept Obviously. that evolution is what evolutionists say it is, according to them, anyway. So um, I, I'm 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 glad to hear that you uh, that you say these things. However, then because then it seems you disagree with every evolutionist I've ever spoken to, including PhDs, that uh, who are geneticists, for example, that this is an example of evolution in action. Uh, and I would, of course, argue with them, as I've already said, this cannot be evolution in action. So what can you cite for me an example of evolution itself that is actually being applied in science? Um, yes, I can. Uh, give me a moment here. I'll actually bring up a paper I have. Um, but first of all, I don't care if they got a gene- if they're a geneticist when they're de- when they're debating you. Well, first of all, it's this is uh, an anecdotal thing that you're, you're presenting here, but I can tell you that there was a population of a particular worm called Nares acuminata, 
which was isolated on the west coast of the U.S. in, in California. I'm, I'm unable to bring up the paper right now, and I'll, I'm going to eventually, but uh, in the interest of not boring everybody, I'll go ahead and continue here. Um, this this population, it was eight individuals that they, indiv they isolated from the coast of California, and then they went ahead and let them reproduce in a lab for a few years. And then after a while, once they got to several thousand, the, there was a small population, two populations, small populations that they isolated in Mass and brought to Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, those two populations were able to uh, individually continue to propagate. And then after about 20 years, these species were brought back together. These individual populations were brought, to, brought back together. The population from, from the West Coast was no longer able to reproduce with either of the populations on the East Coast. That would be speciation. Any, any potential evol or changes in allele, uh, in allele frequency from there is by definition macroevolution. Now you, however, in the past when we've debated on your, on your particular channel that you're, you're looking for, a, for changes in morphology. Now on that, yeah. I would, uh, do you have something? I'll let you go, go ahead and interject. An anatomy, not morphology. Okay, the word you used like seven years ago was morphology. Obviously, you're going to change over time because, you know, that's evolution. Okay, so, Tony, you've fallen into another evolutionist hole. Um, um, uh, you're, you, you just claimed that uh, the uh, ring species and this kind of thing, this nope. thinking, um, is an example of evolution where the inability of, of one population to breed with another um, is an example of evolution. Real quick interjection, uh, about four minutes left, gentlemen, about okay. four minutes left. But, but you haven't provided any, that, that's not an example of evolution, so you, you've, you've failed there. That the inability to breed is is not by cannot be said to be evolution. It doesn't move the organism to, in, in its structural design in one iota towards becoming a fundamentally different type of organism. That's not evolution. That's genetic divergence, perhaps, but that doesn't show a structural design change in the organism that has arisen because of a change in genetic information. That's what you got to have if you're going to say evolution occurs. So you haven't provided an example of evolution there at all. That's not well. Evolution. Well, first of all, you're using your definition of what evolution is. You're not using the scientific ev uh, definition once it's again, which is evolution uh, evolution at or beyond the speciation point. If you're right so, about not, that, hold on. Oh no, I let you finish talking. You can let me. You can show me the same respect. Mm -hmm. Now, let him finish. Uh, so, what you're saying is something should become a fundamentally different. A different creature. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Um, that's not what evolution presents. What mm -hmm. evolution says is that you're going to stay the same thing as your ancestors, but you're going to diversify uh, in a different path than the other descendants from that ancestor. So uh, for a good example here, I'm going to show you these here. Well, hopefully people can see these. Um, in fact, share. There we go. I think I'm hitting share. Okay, so these are a bunch of different species here. There are different species of dog. Most people would probably think they're the you know would would think they're different animals, but really, when you when you know what they are, this is a they're the wolf. All of these are descendants, very different morphologically, and then I would say they are not that much different from this particular species. These particular species here, um, but but. Yep. Tony, if That's... you're showing a picture, it's not showing up. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that doesn't that suck. <laughs> what are you seeing? I uh, just notes. I just see the term John. Oh, really? Well, that sucks. Um, I thought I was showing that. Were you were you seeing it earlier? Uh, no, it's the same stuff. Wow, because all I see is these uh, pictures of skulls. All right. Well, I guess, I guess I'm done. Okay. Well, see me now. Uh, no. Uh, maybe you have to go to the pictures itself on your computer. I'm not sure. Um, share now. I don't know. I can't see anything. Okay. I don't know what to do. 
Well, regardless of the pictures, if you can make your point. Uh, so the pictures were different species of dogs. Like, just describe what the picture was so that you can get to your point. I've added a couple minutes to the time because of technical difficulties. So I don't think that you should be. Having, can you see those? Time to that. I can see it in yes. the Zoom chat, but it's not being broadcast to, to the YouTube channel. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, that, it's not okay. being universal. I'm going to try it one shared. more time. How's that? No? Uh, yeah, we see your computer screen, but no pictures. Oh, well, that, that doesn't work. All right. Well, there you go. We we see the pictures in your little window, but not full screen. Yeah. I'm not sure leave why. It the way, leave it the way that it just was. I think that we'll be able to get the point. Yeah. I'm yeah, I see, I see uh, dog skulls. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And so then look how different those are. But then when you look at these, not as different, but I'm sure you're going to be the first one to say that the macaques are nowhere near the same species as a human. So as far as morphological difference, it's kind of irrelevant as opposed to the, um, the differences between humans and say their, their chimp ancestors. Uh, as I mean, when you consider that dog skulls are, that much of a diversity so i don't know what you're asking for the evolutionary theory though is about changes in allele frequency yeah can i share something now please do would you mind i think that would be fine okay um uh yeah so uh here okay so great Dog skulls are different in morphology. Uh, these are human skulls. They differ in morphology, too. That's not evolution, either. Okay, morphology doesn't equal evolution. Evolutionists believe any change constitutes evolution. But change does not constitute evolution. Here's a here's a, a, the Tong child. Evolutionists claim this is uh, ancestor of human beings. Really? There's a skull of an adolescent chimpanzee right next to it. Guess what it is? It's a baby chimp. It's not a human ancestor. It's just a baby chimp. So human skulls vary considerably too, but that's not evolution. But you, what you've done then now is um, you, you seem to be running from evolution, which I find evolutionists often do when, when you bring to bear their claims. You're claiming that uh, you've attempted to say that uh, this is not evolution uh, of bacterial immunities. But so, Tony, the question is this. If 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 fundamentally different types of organisms never arise and we only see varieties of elephant, but they're always elephant, can evolution theory, could we, and that were true of all the, 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 the taxa of living things, what, what, would that, could we say that we, we see evidence of evolution occurring? Would evolution theory even believe, if evolutionists didn't believe that fundamentally different types of organisms, organisms arise, by, by uh, incremental amount of change. Isn't that true? Well, first of all, the, the, the thing you said was that changes in morphology don't equal evolution. And then you said that all descendants of ele elephants would be elephants. But if we see a change in morphology in elephants, that's just all we see uh, over time, and we see speciation, which you now say isn't evolution either, then I don't understand what your argument is, since we see both changes in allele frequency, we see uh, change, we see speciation, and third of all, and I should I said both at the beginning, but uh, third of all, we also see morphological change even within species. Yeah, and so I don't this, know what Tony, you're arguing, and I don't well, know what you think I'm 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 running away from. Well, it's clear that the, the kinds of changes you evolutionists point to are not evolution at all. They don't move an organism towards becoming a fundamentally different type of organism. Bacterial immunity is another one. This is why you're running from it. The, uh, the changes to allele frequency doesn't provide evidence of it. Differences in the shape of the skull of a dog are not anatomical. That doesn't show us that a dog is producing something non-dog. And, and neither in any example do we know in, in, in this world, a living or fossil. So what you're, you're claiming is examples of evolution, like creatures not being able to breed with each other, doesn't promote the, uh, in any way, doesn't provide evidence that organisms change in such a way as to produce fundamentally different types of organisms over any imaginable period of time. So my point is this, it's not evolution, okay? You think right. you're to wrap evolution, this up, Neff. We have to wrap it up. Not. Yeah, I'll just say uh, evolutionists think they're applying evolution to science. 
but they're not because these are imaginary processes. Uh, they're processes that result in something imaginary and, and they don't have the, the, the ability to create the fundamentally different types of organisms evolution claims arise. All right. So now it's time to go to the closing statements. <clears throat> Excuse me, Tony, since you had started, I'm going to allow you to begin the closing statements as well. These are to last a five minutes. I will set the timer and Tony, you can begin your closing statements, your closing statement. Uh, all right, folks. I would, um, I would try to go ahead and podcast or make this a, <laughs> an actual cast, but I've been messing it up recently. The point of the debate was supposed to be about the scientific applications of creationism versus those of evolution. Over the course of the past hour or so, Nephilim Free has failed to present any real-world applications for creationism. As I predicted, he what he did was take already observed phenomena and apply them and then say they were creationism but nobody predicted them ahead of time the, the strength of evolution is that you can just take a little bit of evidence use the assumption of evolution even if it's 100 percent wrong and predict the future evidence now his claim that designed features were used to predict technology it's just a result of observing and then re recto retroactively crediting it to creationism. He's also gone out of his way to misrepresent evolution in the way that I see over and over, not just by him, but everybody, including Hovind and every other person that I've ever dealt with in this uh, particular subject matter. Um, nobody is saying that the descendant of a dog would ever be anything but a dog well, let me rephrase that. Nobody is saying that an, uh, the descendant of a dog would ever stop being a dog. What they would say, though, is that the descendant of a dog could be different than other descendants of a dog. They'll still be dogs, but they'll be different. And that is what we do, in fact, observe. Now, if you want to compound those, you'll see there's a difference there. Now, as far as uh, being shut out of scientific community, the creationism thing, it's it, creationism, it's not being shut out of science, it's useless. As I said at the beginning, even if creationism were 100% correct, it still has absolutely zero applications. It is therefore not science. Conversely, if evolution were 100% wrong, you are currently benefiting from countless applications of the theory. So to give you some examples of not just evolution, but everything that just isn't part of the creation model. If you're accessing, if you're accessing this debate right now, the fact that there is an internet and devices to access it with, it's due to the physics behind the Big Bang Theory. If you drive, a, if if you sorry, if you even know about most of the fossil species in any, um, I'm sorry, pardon me, I'm going to move forward here. All right, if you the fact that we even know about most of the fossil species in any proposed transitional lineages, whether or not there even are transitional, it's due to the testing of predictions made by evolutionary theory. Uh, if you are driving a car in your daily life. You are benefiting from the bene from the application of uniformitarianism to find these minerals like oil and coal and gold. And you know what? Just a couple months ago, a new synthetic organism was announced, and it's able to digest the plastics that are polluting not just our oceans, but just about everywhere on the planet. And it's due to applying the predictions of abiogenesis. So it doesn't matter which which version of evolution you want to address. Every single one of them makes predictions that we can apply into the real world. So unlike creationism, you can call evolution unproven all you want. You can call it a lie all you want. You can call it dangerous all you want. You can try to refine it all you want. What you can't honestly do is claim that evolution has no scientific applications. So again, I want to say thank you to Standing for Truth, to, to Praise I Am That I Am, to Christopher Mowdy, and to Nephilim Free, of course. And especially a huge thank you to everyone watching right now. Well done, Tony. So that was Tony's uh, closing statement. We are now going to move on. Neff, you now have five minutes for your closing statement. Show us what you got. 
All right. So evolutionists believe they're applying evolution to science when they're only providing their philosophy to science. Uh, my opponent was not able to provide an example of evolution being applied in science. Instead, what he pointed to are two things which not even evolution. Uh, changes in bacterial immunities, for example, changes to the morphology of a skull. Neither of these have the, uh, play any part in an organism moving towards becoming a fundamentally different type of organism. They don't change the structural design of an organism one iota. In fact, in bacterial immunities it could only be put uh, it happen if intelligent design were true. That's creation. Intelligent design is a symptom of creation. When somebody wants to create an automobile, they have to design it intelligently, and it's going to show that it's been intelligently designed. The, I've shown the Tony's statement that we can't find predictability uh, in creation is false uh, with my examples. And I could provide other examples of scientists predicting something based, in on, based upon a young Earth creation model, and then the, the subsequent data verifies their prediction is correct. Tony said that, well, I, that, that can't be shown. I've shown uh, three, four examples. I could show a dozen more. So uh, that, that's absolutely not true. I've shown also that, cr that the design features of living things, which cannot be a product of evolution, are being applied in science constantly in development of new technologies in, in all kinds of fields of science, uh, in many fields of science. And those things cannot be a product of evolution any more than bacterial immunity or the change in morphology of the skull of a dog. So uh, these are not changes to evolution. What we did see, though, is that, that my opponent ran from evolution theory by, um, by, a, a, by saying that, acknowledging that bacterial immunity doesn't really show evolution. And if I pressed him on the skulls dog thing and we had the time to do it, I'd probably get him to admit, well, that's not really observed evolution. That's just uh, the shape of the thing. And then we, we hear him go so far as to say, well, you know, uh, the it, it, evolution pro provides us, doesn't tell us that the offspring of something will ever change, but extrapolated over time, that's exactly what evolutionists claim, that a fundamentally different type of organism will arise. What is evolution theory positive after all? I mean, I, I just can't get it, you know. So evolutionists, when you, when, when you, when you put them on the spot, they often uh, start to run from their own theory. Now, he mentioned ichthyostega and fish evolution uh, into amphibian tetrapods. This is an article I produced over 10 years ago, Tony told me in an email, he's read it. If you read this article, you'll see that the whole fish to, to, to amphibian tetrapod idea is, is junk science. It's not science. The, the features of these creatures do not show evolution from land dwelling into land dwelling creatures from amphibian tetrapods. That's not, that's a scientific idea that's completely bogus. And, and one of the things that proves that is this right here. This, this, the roofing and snout bones of these creatures, they advance, they change, account going up, down, every which way from Sunday. Uh, on the, on the, this is like saying a bicycle evolved into a truck and then it went back to a motorcycle and then it, it evolved into a space shuttle and then went back to being a car and then went on forward to being a, it's ridiculous. It's, it's a story in their mind. It's not science. So he also addressed the cosmic radiation background. But what he didn't fail to, t fail to tell you is that the horizon problem, which is uh, something that scientists universally acknowledge, is astrophysicists, for example, is a problem for their idea that the cosmic background radiation was produced by a big bang. I'd say it was produced by a big creation because the horizon problem tells us that he can't you can't get the cosmic background radiation to be so homogenous but using the billions of uh, uh, six and uh, four and a half billion years of age for uh, for the earth or even 15 and a half billion years of age for the universe it's not nearly enough time you need a hundred or hundreds of billions of years time for the cosmic background radiation to become so homogenous so god could have created it that way like that if you wished it cannot have gotten there over 15 billion years. You need exponentially more time than that. So he didn't tell you about the horizon problem. So in conclusion, what we've heard is no evidence of evolution uh, being applied in science. We've heard ideas that something is evolution. And then when queried about whether something is 28 seconds, thank you, sir. Um, that something is evolution, uh, uh, examples of what evolutionists call evolution, my opponent uh, tries to back swim on that and almost agrees with me that it's not evolution and therefore those examples can't be applied to science either. So I, I think I've shown that uh, science, creation does provide predictability. 
creation is applied in science, and the philosophy of evolutionists has never been or can ever be applied to science. Okay, so that was Neff's closing statement. So again, we are at the end of our debate, but not completely the end, but wait, there's more, just when you thought it was safe. Um, we are going to have another 20 minutes of Q&A. The cues are coming from you, the viewing audience. And if you like what you see, I'm sure that uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that SVT would very much love for you to like their channel and subscribe and you know do all the thumbs up, happiness, social media things that make social media churning the way that it does. Um, but let's begin our 20-minute question and answer period. And I'm actually going to take a little bit of a liberty being the moderator. And I'm going to throw out the first question because this is supposed to be about whether or not science or, uh, I'm sorry, evolution or creationism is applicable in science. And it's pretty clear that the two of you are working from different definitions. Like there is not a meeting of the minds about what operational definitions are for any of these terms. And I think that that has contributed to a little crosstalk. That being said, um, I would like each of you to at least define what you see evolution as and what you see science as. And Tony, I'd like to start with you. Tony, you're muted. I can't hear you. Sorry about that, guys. There it is. All right. Evolution, I mean, ultimately, it just means change over time. But when we're talking about biology, it literally means the change of allele frequencies over time. Now, there is also the fact that these allele frequencies correspond to phenological changes, morphological changes, they're expressed. So that is a consequence of it. And that is uh, the, the, what, uh, what we're actually debating here is the validity of common descent, which is the theory of evolution that all life on Earth that we are aware of arranged uh, De de descended from one common ancestor. What it doesn't say is that anything changed what it was. It, if it became something else, it still retained what it was. It just happens to be more. So to use a very non-evolutionary example or not non-macroevolutionary example, dogs, the first dog was not a poodle and it was not a Great Dane and it wasn't a St. Bernard, but we now have poodles that uh, were that are still dogs but they are not St. Bernards they're not Great Danes now you extend that change over time you now have what we're talking about macroevolution when they're when they're changed enough they're speciated so to say that really quickly ch uh, change in morphology happens all the time speciation makes that change permanent now as far as what science is Ultimately, it's the product of the application of the scientific method. As I said earlier, uh, the scientific method goes like this. You have a theory. You want to explain the matter you see or whatever phenomena you see, and you explain it by making a hypothesis, which goes like this. If we assume this to be true, then we should expect to see this when we perform this experiment or observation. And what I have, what I have presented, whether Nephilim, Nephilim Free wants to admit it or not, is that the discoveries we've made in science have come from taking a, a theory and saying, well, if that theory is true, we should expect to see, let's just say, for example, a Canthostega or a Tiktaalik in this particular strata in this particular location when we do this particular observation that is uh, the difference the, the the science is the application of the scientific method okay fair enough so neff i would like for you to take a little bit of time to uh, explain how you define evolution and how you define science please. okay all right 
According to evolutionists, evolution is a process whereby organisms change in their structural design incrementally over time, which gives rise to new structural designs in their body plans, which ultimately results in, in fundamentally different types of organisms. If that didn't happen, there'd be no, no the evolution theory. When, if evolutionists didn't believe that happened, then there wouldn't even be an evolution theory. Uh, that's what evolution theory is in a nutshell. The changes occur, which give rise to structural design changes in the anatomy of living things, ultimately producing fundamentally different types of organisms over a vast era, age of time, period of time. So that's what evolution uh, theory is. Um, now what science is, is in, 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 in truth, science is queries about the creation and investigative processes to discover its properties and how it functions. Science is a method, and it is a method of investigation to find an answer as to what is the cause of the phenomenon, and this is the scientific method. The scientific method can't be applied to evolution. Evolution theory is uh, a, a set of uh, hypotheses about the arrival of new features in living things which give rise to fundamentally different types of organisms. There's not even anything, any examples that we can point to in all the biological fauna to show, to point to that we could use to apply that to. So in, it's my opinion that evolution theory is a philosophy, but it's not science. Okay, so now that we've got that out in the open. I'm going to now turn it to the audience, the awesome audience that is now going to be the interactive and engaged awesome audience where they're going to be able to ask questions and <clears throat> have the two of you answer them. Tony, you are in the hot seat for the first question, brother. Uh, NIFB Javier Romo, uh, Ramos asks, how can adaptation work because genes always stay the same within the same space? species. I'll say it again. How can adaptation work because genes always stay the same within the same species? Genes don't always stay the same within the same species. They don't even stay the same within the same family. Do you look like your dad? Probably resemble him, but you don't look completely like him, except in probably a few very r random examples. You probably don't look exactly like your mom either. Now, here's the thing. From birth, you have well over 100 different mutations that you did not have, that, that your parents did not have, and you will gain several more of your lifetime. So not even you are the same at the end of your life as you are at the beginning of your life. So the, 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 the question really doesn't apply, and it also isn't an application of the theory. All right, Neff, I got you in the hot seat. Please define, and this is from Emotionally Stunted Emoticon. Please define anatomical change in biology. Okay, anatomy is the uh, study of the features of organisms and where they lie in the body plan of an organism. And uh, evolution posits that, that that changes over time to result in fundamentally different types of organisms. So uh, the definition of anatomy and, and morphology and these things, they're freely available on the internet. Okay, and he has a follow-up to the second part to that question. Uh, apparently, there's a person called Rawmat. Rawmat accepts that rice, corn, and bamboo are all the same kind. Aren't they anatomically different? And if not, explain why. Well, I haven't examined those examples, so I don't want to speak for somebody else. I, I can't actually comment it because I haven't studied that that a specific subject about the uh, uh, the uh, you know relationship of these, the, or it, whether uh, real or imagined, of of these uh, different taxa. Hey, I know that I know that I'm speaking out of turn here. That was a good question, and and uh, Nephilim gave, Neph gave a great answer to it. And it would be the same answer I would give. So could you give a reference for that? To whom are you asking the question, Neff? Uh, no, the person that actually asked that question. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not refuting them. I just had never heard that those are the same. I, I mean, I know that that uh, cabbage and 
and kale and all those came from mustard seeds. But I'd I'd love to hear about the the uh, the common the common uh, nature of rice and corn. I, I've never heard that before. And I'm a little confused by the question because there, he, he used the word kind. I don't know whether he's referring to like um, like Kent Hovind will frequently talk about kinds as his categor, categorization word of choice. I don't know whether he's using it in that term or in a more scientific term. But um, to your point, Tony, emotionally stunted emoticon. Um, if you can pull a reference for the fact that rice, corn, and bamboo are the same kind or that somebody says that, if you can pull a reference for that and post it, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Moving back to you. Let's see, Tony, what do we got here? For some reason, I don't really have that many more for you. Um, hold on one moment. There are more. Oh, yes, there are more. Okay, Tony, how do outside pressures and forces affect blind reproduction to produce an offspring that can survive in changed conditions? I know that this is a very complex, it, there's even more to this question, but I think that that's, that's a lot to bite off. This is from Colin Smith. I'll say it again. How do outside pressures and forces affect blind reproduction to produce an offspring that can survive in changed conditions? Considering reproduction doesn't think or blah, 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 blah. There's more to the question. Fair enough. It's a fair question. Uh, in our daily lives, we see people that are more adapted. They either can run faster or they can, they're stronger. They can climb faster. They can speak faster. They can think better than others. I mean, we all have different abilities. And as the environment changes, your particular set of skills are more likely to, I mean, well, the, the, the environment just might be perfect for your set of skills and for somebody else, not so much. And so from there on, you are, you're, you're, you're more likely to reproduce. The person who's not as adjusted to this environment is, is less likely to reproduce. It has, <clears throat> in case somebody wants to bring it up, it's not about death. It's about reproduction. Now. That said, if you're more likely to reproduce, you're more likely to continue. If you're less likely to reproduce, you're less likely to present to 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 continue. It isn't an absolute. There are certain people who are definitely not fit for the environment that tend to reproduce. And they have a chance, perhaps their their offspring probably have a chance in, in the next generation. But it has every the 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 impact of the environment is just your playground. And if you're better suited to play in that playground and, and reproduce, you just happen to be more likely to continue. That's it. Okay. Question. Uh, moving on to Neff. Um, ask Neff. <clears throat> this is from Beach Price. Why fetus... Why I'm trying to decipher this. Why do fetuses have lizard muscles in their hands that disappear before birth? Why would intelligent design do that? Um, well, I'm not familiar with that. Um, but the assumption that they're lizard muscles, I think, is is the problem. Uh, during fetal fetal development is an outrageously complex process. It's so, in fact, complex. The expression of various sets of genes being turned on and off like the instruments in orchestra in a humongous orchestra that would fill a gigantic stadium in fact uh, being turned on and off in concert during to develop the to specialize cells and to uh, dis, uh, to uh, uh, prescribe their arrangement and uh, to create the structural designs of an organism it's so complex that man will probably never be able to fully decipher it, I, no matter how long we study genetics. Um, I think anybody can, gives honest consideration to that fact, the absolute, the mind-bending complexity of phenotype of the uh, fetal development process would drop evolution like a rock if they were intellectually honest with themselves. Uh, I, I, evolutionists make many assumptions uh, you know, that this is, uh, humans have this feature in them that came from, you know, lizards or, or fisher pods. 
and uh, none of those have really bared out. Uh, it, it, I, I see it as uh, an assumption um, that that this was a lizard muscle. First of all, is it really a muscle? I'd have to examine the papers, find out is it a muscle? Does it come and does it go? Is, does it have a purpose? Does it actually transform into a different muscle? I need more details than, than what I've been provided. And I'm quite sure that if I studied the subject, I'd find it's no such thing as a lizard muscle. This is just based on an evolution paradigm. It's an assumption that doesn't hold water. All right, Tony. Uh, Colin has another question for you. How do you justify uniformity and basic abstract laws of logic apart from your own experiences? I don't really know what the question is asking. I think that it's trying to get at, um, so it, there's some follow-up questions, trying to get at the difference between objectivity and subjective experience, right? Is uniformity in nature objective? If so, how do we know that apart from experience? Seems to be a subjective, objective kind of a question that dances on, on that distinction. I'll do my best to answer that question, um, but <clears throat> I'm not sure how the two go. I mean, if you're talking about the subjective forces, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me. Um, when I talk about uniformity, I'm usually talking about geological uniformity. So if you're going to talk about the, the, uh, the forces at work in a particular area versus over the overall world. Um, well, I guess that's the answer. Uh, is the subjectivity is in one area, whereas objectivity would be the entire, uh, the entire map that we're playing with, which would be the entire world. If you're talking about our personal experience, well, there's a different question. Um, all we can do is comment on our own subjective experience. So, yeah, it is very likely. And so when, when I, even when I talked about this from the beginning, I said I'm working under the assumption that evolution is completely wrong and that evolution is completely right. And so that even in that case, we are able to make these predictions based on evolution. Now, that still... That's, that's basically a statement about what we've experienced subjectively as a species or as a community. But there is always a chance that all of it is completely wrong. We just happen to have made so many guesses right beforehand. I hope that answered the question. I really do. I think that it was, the, I think that it was rooted in like more presuppositional apologetics, which try to well, I'm not, I'm not going to, as a moderator, I'm not going to get into explaining what that is. Um, but that's an assumption of mine. Um, well, actually, Colin just posted something. You can't justify uniformity apart from your experiences. In other words, the scientific method cannot justify the scientific method. So he's pointing out a circularity, a, a philosophical circularity, it seems. Okay. So then I guess the difference is uh, when it comes to. <laughs> the scientific method it's based on what i can show you and what you can show me now you're welcome to believe in creationism all you want but once you ask me to believe it then i'm going to ask you for evidence and if you can present a prediction based on on creationism i'm more than happy to consider it now when it comes to evolution, I can make predictions and I can present them to you. It's up to you whether you accept them. But I mean, it, it all comes down to I can present my evidence. I can take the assumption of uniformity and file, find oil for you. I can take the assumption of quantum mechanics and create the internet or create a computer for you. I can take the assumption of the theory of, of, of relativity and get a guy to the moon. What can you do with creationism? That's what I've been asking this entire debate. All right. And so we only have a couple minutes left uh, for this Q and a section. So Neff, how would you like to answer Tony's question that he just asked? Well, I would just say that our ability to predict and to uh, discern the properties of things and to be able to apply them, depends on uh, the existence of objective reality. 
and I think that uh, uh, that that wouldn't be if uh, if if uh, if subjectivity if, if there is no objective reality, then science wouldn't exist. Our thoughts wouldn't exist. We couldn't observe, test, demonstrate, or repeat anything. Uh, the existence of an objective reality uh, uh, is everything is dependent upon the existence of an objective reality. Uh, so the fact that we're here, the fact that we're thinking about it, the fact that we can show things, demonstrate things, hypothesize about things, demonstrates objectively that there is a reality that has a fundamental basis that is so the, 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 uh, a basis that is so fundamental that I don't believe uh, the uh, atheist or evolutionist worldview could begin to account for it. That's my thoughts. All right. Well, we only have about 30 seconds left. Um, so we're going to wrap it up from there. And I would like to thank both Tony Reed and Nephilim Free for dedicating some time for this conversation today, this debate about whether creationism or evolution or applicable in science. I would also like to thank uh, Standing for Truth for hosting the, the debate as well as Praise I Am That I Am for all the technical awesomeness that facilitated this becoming a reality. Um, if anybody wants to have a post hang about this, I'm sure that you will have a lot of willing participants wanting to debate the topics and stuff. And um, other than that, I think that's it from my end. Thank everybody for watching what? and contributing. All right. Good night.